A Journey to the Interior of the Earth by Jules Verne. Chapter 35 An Electric Storm. Friday, August 21st. On the morrow, the magnificent geyser has disappeared. The wind has risen and has rapidly carried us away from Axel Island. The roarings become lost in the distance. The weather, if we may use the term, will change before long. The atmosphere is charged with vapors, pervaded with the electricity generated by the evaporation of saline waters. The clouds are sinking lower and assume an olive hue. The electric light can scarcely penetrate through the dense curtain which is dropped over the theater on which the battle of the elements is about to be waged. I feel peculiar sensations, like many creatures on earth at the approach of violent atmospheric changes. The heavily voluted cumulus clouds lower gloomily and threateningly. They wear that impeccable look which I have sometimes noted at the outbreak of a great storm. The air is heavy. The sea is calm. In the distance, the clouds resemble great bales of cotton, piled up in picturesque disorder. By degrees they dilate, then gain in huge size what they lose in number. Such is their ponderous weight that they cannot rise from the horizon, but obeying an impulse from higher currents, their dense consistency slowly yields. The gloom upon them deepens, and they soon present to our view a ponderous mass of almost level surface. From time to time a fleecy tuft of mist, with yet some gleaming light left upon it, drops down upon the dense floor of gray, and loses itself in the opaque and impenetrable mass. The atmosphere is evidently charged and surcharged with electricity. My whole body is saturated. My hair bristles just as when you stand upon an insulated stool under the action of an electrical machine. It seems to me as if my companions, the moment they touched me, would receive a severe shock like that from an electric eel. At ten in the morning, the symptoms of storm become aggravated. The wind never lulls, but to acquire increased strength. The vast bank of heavy clouds is a huge reservoir of fearful, windy gusts and rushing storms. I am loath to believe these atmospheric menaces, and yet I cannot help muttering. Here is some very bad weather coming on. The professor made no answer. His temper is awful to judge from the working of his features, as he sees this vast length of ocean unrolling before him to an indefinite extent. He can only spare time to shrug his shoulders viciously. There's a heavy storm coming on, I cried, pointing towards the horizon. Those clouds seem as if they were going to crush the sea. A deep silence falls on all around. The lately roaring winds are hushed into a dead calm. Nature seems to breathe no more, and to be sinking into the stillness of death. On the mast already I see the light play of a lament at St. Elwell's fire. The outstretched sail catches not a breath of wind and hangs like a sheet of lead. The rudder stands motionless in a sluggish, waveless sea. But if we have now ceased to advance, why do we yet leave that sail loose, which at the first shock of a tempest may capsize us in a moment? Let us reef the sail and cut down the mast, I cry. That will be the safest. No, no, never, shouted my impetuous uncle. Never. Let the wind catch us if it will. What I want is to get at least a glimpse of rock, or sure, even if our raft should be smashed into shivers. The words were hardly out of his mouth when a sudden change took place in the southern sky. The piled-up vapors condensed into water, and the air put into violent action to supply the vacuum left by the condensation of the mist rouses itself into a whirlwind. It rushes on from the farthest recesses of the vast cavern. The darkness deepens. Scarcely can I jot down a few hurried notes. 
the helm makes a bound my uncle falls full length i creep close to him he has laid a firm hold upon a rope and appears to watch with grim satisfaction this awful display of elemental strife hans stirs not his long hair blown by the pelting storm and laid flat across his immovable countenance makes him a strange figure for the end of each lock of loose flowing hair is tipped with little luminous radiations this frightful mask of electric sparks suggests to me even in this dizzy excitement a comparison with pre-adamite man the contemporary of the ithacosaurus or the megatherian the mask yet holds firm the cell stretches tight like a bubble ready to burst the raft flies at a rate that i cannot reckon but not so fast as the foaming clouds of spray which it dashes from side to side in its headlong speed a sail a sail i cry motioning to lower it no replies my uncle nej repeats hans leisurely shaking his head but now the rain forms a crushing cataract in front of that horizon toward which we are running with such maddening speed but before it has reached us the rain cloud parts asunder the sea boils and the electric fires are brought into violent action by a mighty chemical power that descends from the higher regions the most vivid flashes of lightning are mingled with the violent crash of continuous thunder ceaseless fiery arrows dart in and out amongst the fiery thunder clouds the vaporous mass soon glows with an incandescent heat hailstones rattle fiercely down and as they dash upon our iron tools they too emit gleams and flashes of lurid light the heaving waves resemble fiery volcanic hills each belching forth its own interior flames and every crest is plumed with dancing fire my eyes fail under the dazzling light my ears are stunned with the incessant crash of thunder i must be bound to the mast which bows like a reed before the mighty strength of the storm here my notes become vague and indistinct i have only been able to find a few which i seem to have jotted down almost unconsciously but their very brevity and their obscurity reveal the intensity of the excitement which dominated me and describe the actual position even better than my memory could do sunday twenty three where are we driven forward with a swiftness that cannot be measured the night was fearful no abatement of the storm the din and uproar are incessant our ears are bleeding to exchange a word is impossible the lightning flashes with intense brilliancy and never seems to cease for a moment zigzag streams of bluish-white fire dance down upon the sea and rebound and then make an upward flight till they strike the granite vault that overreaches our heads suppose that solid roof should crumble down upon our heads other flashes with incessant play cross their vivid fires while others again roll themselves into balls of living fire which explode like bombshells but the music of which scarcely adds to the din of the battle strife that almost deprives us of our senses of hearing and sight the limit of intense loudness has been passed within which the human ear can distinguish one sound from another if all the powder magazines in the world were to explode at once we should hear no more than we do now from the under surface of the clouds there are continual emissions of lurid light electric matter is in continual evolution from their component molecules the gaseous elements of the air need to be slaked with moisture for innumerable columns of water rush upwards into the air and fall back again in white foam whither are we flying my uncle lies full length across the raft the heat increases I refer to the thermometer. It indicates the figure is obliterated. Monday, August 24th. Will there be an end to it? Is the atmospheric condition, having once reached its density, to become final? We are prostrated and worn out with fatigue, but Hans is as usual. 
the raft bears on still to the southeast. We have made two hundred leagues since we left Axel Island. At noon, the violence of the storm redoubles. We are obliged to secure as fast as possible every article that belongs to our cargo. Each of us is lashed to some part of the raft. The waves rise above our heads. For three days we have never been able to make each other hear a word. Our mouths open, our lips move, but not a word can be heard. We cannot even make ourselves heard by approaching our mouth close to the ear. My uncle has drawn near to me. He has uttered a few words. They seem to be, we are lost, but I am not sure. At last I write down the words, let us lower the sail. He nods his consent. Scarcely has he lifted his head again before a ball of fire has bounded over the waves and lighted on board our raft. Mast and sail flew up in an instant together, and I saw them carried up to prodigious heights, resembling in appearance a pterodactyl, one of those strong birds of the infant world. We lay there, our blood running cold with unspeakable terror, the fireball, half of it white, half azure blue, and the size of a ten-inch shell, moved slowly about the raft, but revolving on its own axis with astonishing velocity, as if whipped round by the force of the whirlwind. Here it comes, there it glides, now it is up the ragged stump of the mast, thence it lightly leaps on the provision bag, descends with a light bound, and just skims the powder magazine. Horrible! We shall be blown up! But no, the dazzling disk of mysterious light nimbly leaps aside. It approaches Hans, who fixes his blue eye upon it steadily. It threatens the head of my uncle, who falls upon his knees with his head down to avoid it. And now my turn comes, pale and trembling under the blinding splendor and the melting heat. It drops at my feet, spinning silently round upon the deck. I try to move my foot away, but cannot. A suffocating smell of nitrogen fills the air. It enters the throat. It fills the lungs. We suffer stifling pains. Why am I unable to move my foot? Is it riveted to the planks? Alas! The fall upon our faded raft of this electric globe has magnetized every iron article on board. The instruments, the tools, our guns are clashing and clanking violently in their collisions with each other. The nails of my boots cling tenaciously to a plate of iron led into the timbers. A Journey to the Interior of the Earth by Jules Verne Chapter 36 Calm Philosophic Discussions Here I end what I may call my log, happily saved from the wreck, and I resume my narrative as before. What happened when the raft was dashed upon the rocks is more than I can tell. I felt myself hurled into the waves, and, if I escaped from death, 
and, if my body was not torn over the sharp edges of the rocks, it was because the powerful arm of Hans came to my rescue. The brave Icelander carried me out of the reach of the waves, over a burning sand, where I found myself by the side of my uncle. Then he returned to the rocks, against which the furious waves were beating, to save what he could. I was unable to speak. I was shattered with fatigue and excitement. I wanted a whole hour to recover even a little. But a deluge of rain was still falling, though with that violence which generally denotes the near cessation of a storm. A few overhanging rocks afforded us some shelter from the storm. Hans prepared some food, which I could not touch, and each of us, exhausted with three sleepless nights, fell into a broken and painful sleep. The next day the weather was splendid. The sky and the sea had sunk into sudden repose. Every trace of the awful storm had disappeared. The exhilarating voice of the professor fell upon my ears as I awoke. He was ominously cheerful. "'Well, my boy,' he cried, "'have you slept well?' Would not any one have thought that we were still in our cheerful little house on the Konigstrasse, and that I was only just coming down to breakfast, and that I was to be married to Groiben that day? Alas! If the tempest had but sent the raft a little more east, we should have passed under Germany, under my beloved town of Hamburg, under the very street where dwelt all that I loved most in the world. Then only forty leagues would have separated us but they were forty leagues perpendicular of solid granite wall, and in reality we were a thousand leagues asunder. All these painful reflections rapidly crossed my mind before I could answer my uncle's question. "'Well, now,' he repeated, "'won't you tell me how you have slept?' "'Oh, very well,' I said. "'I am only a little knocked up, but I shall soon be better.' "'Oh,' said my uncle, "'that's nothing to signify. "'You are only a little bit tired.' "'But you, uncle, you seem in very good spirits this morning.' "'Delighted, my boy, delighted. "'We have got there.' "'To our journey's end?' "'No. "'But we have got to the end of that endless sea. "'Now we shall go by land, and really begin to go down. "'Down, down!' "'But, my dear uncle,' "'Do let me ask you one question.' "'Of course, Axel.' "'How about returning?' "'Returning? "'Why, you are talking about the return before the arrival.' "'No, I only want to know how that is to be managed.' "'In the simplest way possible. "'When we have reached the centre of the globe, "'either we shall find some new way to get back, "'or we shall come back like decent folks the way we came.' I feel pleased at the thought that it is sure not to be shut against us. But then we shall have to refit the raft. Of course. Then, as to provisions, have we enough to last? Yes, to be sure we have. Hans is a clever fellow, and I am sure he must have saved a large part of our cargo. But still, let us go and make sure. We left this grotto which lay open to every wind. At the same time I cherished a trembling hope which was a fear as well. It seemed to me impossible that the terrible wreck of the raft should not have destroyed everything on board. On my arrival on the shore I found Hans surrounded by an assemblage of articles all arranged in good order. My uncle shook hands with him with a lively gratitude. This man, with almost superhuman devotion, had been at work while all the while that we were asleep and had saved the most precious of the articles at the risk of his life. Not that we had suffered no losses, for instance, our firearms, but we might do without them. Our stock of powder had remained uninjured after having risked blowing up during the storm. Well, cried the professor, as we have no guns, we cannot hunt, that's all. Yes, but how about the instruments? Here is the aneroid, the most useful of all, and for which I would have given all the others. By means of it I can calculate the depth and know when we have reached the center. Without it we might very likely go beyond and come out at the Antipodes. 
Such high spirits as these were rather too strong. But where is the compass? I asked. Here it is, upon this rock, in perfect condition, as well as the thermometers and the chronometer. The hunter is a splendid fellow. There was no denying it. We had all our instruments. As for tools and appliances, there they all lay on the ground ladders, ropes, picks, spades, etc. Still, there was the question of provisions to be settled, and I asked, How are we off for provisions? The boxes containing these were in a line upon the shore, in a perfect state of preservation. For the most part, the sea had spared them, and what with biscuits, salt meat, spirits, and salt fish, we might reckon on four months' supply. Four months! cried the professor. We have time to go and to return, and with all that is left, I will give a grand dinner to my friends at the Johannium. I ought by this time to have been quite accustomed to my uncle's ways, yet there was always something fresh about him to astonish me. Now, said he, we will replenish our supply of water with the rain which the storm has left us in all these granite basins. Therefore, we shall have no reason to fear anything from thirst. As for the raft, I will recommend Hans to do his best to repair it, although I don't expect it will be of any further use to us. How so? I cried. An idea of my own, my lad. I don't think we shall come out by the way that we went in. I stared at the professor with a good deal of mistrust. I asked, Was he not touched in the brain? And yet there was method in his madness. And now let us go to breakfast, said he. I followed him to a headland, after he had given his instructions to the hunter. There preserved meat, biscuits, and tea made us an excellent meal, one of the best I ever remember. Hunger, the fresh air, the calm, quiet weather, after the commotions we had gone through, all contributed to give me a good appetite. Whilst breakfasting, I took the opportunity to put to my uncle the question where we were now. That seems to me, I said, rather difficult to make out. Yes, it is difficult, he said, to calculate exactly, perhaps even impossible, since during these three stormy days I have been unable to keep any account of the rate or direction of the raft, but still we may get an approximation. The last observation, I remarked, was made on the island where the geyser was. You mean Axel Island. Don't decline the honor of having given your name to the first island ever discovered in the central parts of the globe. Well, said I, let it be Axel Island. Then we had cleared two hundred and seventy leagues of sea, and we were six hundred leagues from Iceland. Very well, answered my uncle. Let us start from that point and count four days' storm, during which our rate cannot have been less than eighty leagues in the twenty-four hours. That is right, and this would make three hundred leagues more. Yes, and the Liedenbrock Sea would be six hundred leagues from shore to shore. Surely, Axel, it may vie in size with the Mediterranean itself. Especially, I replied, if it happens that we have only crossed it in its narrowest part. And it is a curious circumstance, I added, that if my computations are right, and we are nine hundred leagues from Reykjavik, we now have the Mediterranean above our head. That is a good long way, my friend. But whether we are under Turkey or the Atlantic depends very much on the question in which direction we have been moving. Perhaps we have deviated. No, I think not. Our course has been the same all along, and I believe this shore is southeast of Port Grauben. Well, replied my uncle, we may easily ascertain this by consulting the compass. Let us go and see what it says. The professor moved toward the rock upon which Hans had laid down the instruments. He was gay and full of spirits. He rubbed his hands. He studied his attitudes. I followed him, curious to know if I was right in my estimate. As soon as we had arrived at the rock, my uncle took the compass, laid it horizontally, and questioned the needle, which, after a few oscillations, presently assumed a fixed position. My uncle looked, and looked, and looked again. He rubbed his eyes, and then turned to me, thunderstruck with some unexpected discovery. "'What is the matter?' I asked. He motioned me to look. An exclamation of astonishment burst from me. The north pole of the needle was turned to what we supposed to be the south. It pointed to the shore instead of to the open sea. 
I shook the box, examined it again. It was in perfect condition. In whatever position I placed the box, the needle pertinaciously returned to this unexpected quarter. Therefore, there seemed no reason to doubt that during the storm there had been a sudden change of wind unperceived by us, which had brought our raft back to the shore, which we thought we had left so long a distance behind us. End of chapter 36「A Journey to the Interior of the Earth」by Jules Verne Chapter 37 The Liedenbrock Museum of Geology How shall I describe the strange series of passions which in succession shook the breast of Professor Liedenbrock? First stupefaction, then incredulity, lastly a downright burst of rage. Never had I seen the man so put out of countenance and so disturbed. The fatigues of our passage across, the dangers met, had all to be begun over again. We had gone backwards instead of forwards. But my uncle rapidly recovered himself. Aha! Will fate play tricks upon me? Will the elements lay plots against me? Shall fire, air, and water make a combined attack against me? Well, they shall know what a determined man can do. I will not yield. I will not stir a single foot backwards, and it will be seen whether man or nature is to have the upper hand. Erect upon the rock, angry and threatening, Otto Liedenbrock was a rather grotesque fierce parody upon the fierce Achilles defying the lightning. But I thought it my duty to interpose and attempt to lay some restraint upon this unmeasured fanaticism. "'Just listen to me,' I said firmly. "'Ambition must have a limit somewhere. We cannot perform impossibilities. We are not at all fit for another sea voyage.' Who would dream of undertaking a voyage of five hundred leagues upon a heap of rotten planks, with a blanket in rags for a sail, a stick for a mast, and fierce winds in our teeth? We cannot steer. We shall be buffeted by the tempests, and we should be fools and madmen to attempt to cross a second time. I was able to develop this series of unanswerable reasons for ten minutes without interruption. Not that the professor was paying any respectful attention to his nephew's arguments, but because he was deaf to all my eloquence. "'To the raft!' he shouted. Such was his only reply. It was no use for me to entreat, supplicate, get angry, or do anything else in the way of opposition. It would only have been opposing a will harder than any granite rock. Hans was finishing the repairs of the raft. One would have thought that this strange being was guessing at my uncle's intentions. With a few more pieces of certibrand he had refitted our vessel. A sail already hung from the new mast, and the wind was playing in its waving folds. The professor said a few words to the guide, and immediately he put everything on board and arranged every necessary for our departure. The air was clear, and the northwest wind blew steadily. What could I do? Could I stand against the two? It was impossible. If Hans had but taken my side! But no, it was not to be. The Icelander seemed to have renounced all will of his own, and made a vow to forget and deny himself. I could get nothing out of a servant so feudalized, as it were, to his master. My only course was to proceed. I was therefore going with as much resignation as I could find to resume my accustomed place on the raft, when my uncle laid his hand upon my shoulder. "'We shall not sail until to-morrow,' he said. "'I made a movement intended to express resignation. "'I must neglect nothing,' he said, "'and since my fate has driven me on to this part of the coast, "'I will not leave it until I have examined it. "'To understand what followed, it must be borne in mind that, "'although circumstances hereafter are to be explained, "'we were not really where the professor supposed we were. "'In fact, we were not upon the north shore of the sea.' "'Now let us start upon fresh discoveries,' I said. "'And, leaving Hans to his work, we started off together. "'The space between the water and the foot of the cliffs was considerable. "'It took half an hour to bring us to the wall of rock. 
we trampled under our feet numberless shells of all the forms and sizes which existed in the earliest ages of the world. I also saw immense carapaces, more than fifteen feet in diameter. They had been the coverings of those giant glyptodons or armadillos of the Pliocene period, of which the modern tortoise is but a miniature representative. The soil was beside this scattered with stony fragments, boulders rounded by water action, and ridged up in successive lines. I was therefore led to the conclusion that at one time the sea must have covered the ground on which we were treading. On the loose and scattered rocks, now out of reach of the highest tides, the waves had left manifest traces of their power to wear their way in the hardest stone. This might, up to a certain point, explain the existence of an ocean forty leagues beneath the surface of the globe. But, in my opinion, this liquid mass would be lost by degrees farther and farther within the interior of the earth, and it certainly had its origin in the waters of the ocean overhead, which had made their way hither through some fissure. Yet it must be believed that the fissure is now closed, and that all this cavern or immense reservoir was filled in a very short time. Perhaps even this water, subjected to the fierce action of central heat, had partly been resolved into vapor. This would explain the existence of those clouds suspended above our heads, and the development of that electricity which raised such tempests within the bowels of the earth. This theory of the phenomenon we had witnessed seemed satisfactory to me, for however great and stupendous the phenomena of nature, fixed physical laws will or may always explain them. We were therefore walking upon sedimentary soil, the deposits of the waters of former ages. The professor was carefully examining every little fissure in the rocks. Wherever he saw a hole he always wanted to know the depth of it. To him this was important. We had traversed the shores of the Liedenbrock Sea for a mile when we observed a sudden change in the appearance of the soil. It seemed upset, contorted, and convulsed by a violent upheaval of the lower strata. In many places depressions or elevation gave witness to some tremendous power affecting the dislocation of strata. We moved with difficulty across these granite fissures and chasms mingled with silex, crystals of quartz, and alluvial deposits, when a field, nay, more than a field, a vast plain of bleached bones lay spread before us. It seemed like an immense cemetery, where the remains of twenty ages mingled their dust together. Huge mounds of bony fragments rose stage after stage in the distance. They undulated away to the limits of the horizon, and melted in the distance in a faint haze. There, within three square miles, were accumulated the materials for a complete history of the animal life of ages, a history scarcely outlined in the two recent strata of the inhabited world. But an impatient curiosity impelled our steps. Crackling and rattling, our feet were trampling on the remains of prehistoric animals and interesting fossils, the possession of which is a matter of rivalry and contention between museums of great cities. A thousand cuviers could never have reconstructed the organic remains deposited in this magnificent and unparalleled collection. I stood amazed. My uncle had uplifted his long arms to the vault which was our sky, his mouth gaping wide, his eyes flashing behind his shining spectacles, his head balancing with an up-and-down motion, his whole attitude denoted unlimited astonishment. Here he stood facing an immense collection of scattered Leptotheria, Mericotheria, Lophiodia, Amplotheria, Megatheria, Mastodons, Protopithecae, Pterodactyls, and all sorts of extinct monsters here assembled together for his special satisfaction. Fancy an enthusiastic bibliomaniac suddenly brought into the midst of the famous Alexandrian library, burnt by Omar and restored by a miracle from its ashes. Just such a crazed enthusiast was my uncle, Professor Liedenbrock. But more was to come when, with a rush through the clouds of bone dust, he laid his hand upon a bare skull, and cried with a voice trembling with excitement, Axel! Axel! A human head! A human skull? I cried, 
no less astonished. "'Yes, nephew, aha! Monsieur Milne Edwards, aha! Monsieur de Quatrefage, how I wish you were standing here at the side of Otto Liedenbrock. End of chapter 37 Chapter 38 The Professor in His Chair Again To understand this apostrophe of my uncle's, made to absent French savants, it will be necessary to allude to an event of high importance in a paleontological point of view, which had occurred a little while before our departure. On the 28th of March, 1863, some excavators working under the direction of M. Boucher de Perth in the stone quarries of moulin Quignon near Abbeville, in the department of Somme, found a human jawbone fourteen feet beneath the surface. It was the first fossil of this nature that had ever been brought to light. Not far distant were found stone hatchets and flint arrowheads stained and encased by lapse of time with a uniform coat of rust. The noise of this discovery was very great, not in France alone, but in England and in Germany. Several savants of the French Institute, amongst them Messrs. Milne Edwards and de Quatrefage, saw at once the importance of this discovery, proved to demonstration the genuineness of the bone in question, and became the most ardent defendants in what the English called this trial of a jawbone. To geologists of the United Kingdom, who believed in the certainty of the fact, Messrs. Falconer, Busk, Carpenter, and others, scientific Germans were soon joined, and amongst them the forwardest, the most fiery, and the most enthusiastic was my uncle Liedenbrock. Therefore, the genuineness of a fossil human relic of the quaternary period seemed to be incontestably proved and admitted. It is true that this theory met with a most obstinate opponent in M. Elie de Beaumont. This high authority maintained that the soil of moulin Quignon was not diluvial at all, but was of a much more recent formation, and, agreeing in that with Cuvier, he refused to admit that the human species could be contemporary with the animals of the quaternary period. My uncle Liedenbrock, along with the great body of the geologists, had maintained his ground, disputed, and argued, until M. Elie de Beaumont stood almost alone in his opinion. We knew all these details, but we were not aware that since our departure the question had advanced to farther stages. Other similar maxillaries, though belonging to individuals of various types and different nations, were found in the loose grey soil of certain grottoes in France, Switzerland, and Belgium, as well as weapons, tools, earthen utensils, bones of children and adults. The existence, therefore, of man in the quaternary period seemed to become daily more certain. Nor was this all. Fresh discoveries of remains in the Pliocene formation had emboldened other geologists to refer back the human species to a higher antiquity still. It is true that these remains were not human bones, but objects bearing the traces of his handiwork, such as fossil leg bones of animals, sculptured and carved evidently by the hand of man. Thus, at one bound, the record of existence of man receded far back into the history of the ages past. He was a predecessor of the Mastodon. He was a contemporary of the southern elephant. He lived a hundred thousand years ago, when, according to geologists, the Pliocene formation was in progress. Such, then, was the state of paleontological science, and what we knew of it was sufficient to explain our behavior in the presence of this stupendous Golgotha. Any one may now understand the frenzied excitement of my uncle when, twenty yards farther on, he found himself face to face with a primitive man. It was a perfectly recognizable human body. Had some particular soil, like that of the cemetery Saint-Michel at Bordeaux, preserved it thus for so many ages? It might be so. But this dried corpse, with its parchment-like skin drawn tightly over the bony frame, the limbs still preserving their shape, sound teeth, abundant hair, and finger and toenails of frightful length. This desiccated mummy startled us by appearing just as it had lived countless ages ago. I stood mute before this apparition of remote antiquity. My uncle, usually so garrulous, was struck dumb likewise. We raised the body. We stood it up against a rock. 
It seemed to stare at us out of its empty orbits. We sounded with our knuckles his hollow frame. After some moments' silence the professor was himself again. Otto Liedenbrock, yielding to his nature, forgot all the circumstances of our eventful journey, forgot where we were standing, forgot the vaulted cavern which contained us. No doubt he was in mind back again in his Johannium, holding forth to his pupils, for he assumed his learned air, and, addressing himself to an imaginary audience, he proceeded thus. "'Gentlemen, I have the honour to introduce to you a man of the quaternary or post-tertiary system. Eminent geologists have denied his existence, others no less eminent have affirmed it. The St. Thomases of paleontology, if they were here, might now touch him with their fingers, and would be obliged to acknowledge their error. I am quite aware that science has to be on its guard with discoveries of this kind. I know what capital enterprising individuals like Barnum have made out of fossil men. I have heard the tale of the knee-pan of Ajax, the pretended body of Orestes claimed to have been found by the Spartans, and of the body of Asterius, ten cubits long, of which Pausanias speaks. I have read the reports of the skeleton of Trapani, found in the fourteenth century, and which was at the time identified as that of Polyphemus, and the history of the giant unearthed in the sixteenth century near Palermo. You know, as well as I do, gentlemen, the analysis made at Lucerne in 1577 of those huge bones which the celebrated Dr. Felix Plater affirmed to be those of a giant nineteen feet high. I have gone through the treatises of Cassanian, and all those memoirs, pamphlets, answers, and rejoinders published respecting the skeleton of Tutabacchus, the invader of Gaul, dug out of a sand-pit in the Dauphine in 1613. In the eighteenth century I would have stood up for Scheusser's pre-Adamite man against Peter Campet. I have perused a writing, entitled Gigant... Here my uncle's unfortunate infirmity met him, that of being unable in public to pronounce hard words. The pamphlet entitled Gigant... He could get no further. Gigantio... It was not to be done. The unlucky word would not come out. At the Johannium there would have been a laugh. Gigantoosteology, at last the professor burst out between two words which I shall not record here. Then, rushing on with renewed vigor and great animation, Yes, gentlemen, I know all these things and more. I know that Cuvier and Blumenbach have recognized in these bones nothing more remarkable than the bones of the mammoth and other mammals of the post-tertiary period but in the presence of this specimen to doubt would be to insult science. There stands the body. You may see it, touch it. It is not a mere skeleton. It is an entire body, preserved for a purely anthropological end and purpose. I was good enough not to contradict this startling assertion. If I could only wash it in a solution of sulfuric acid, pursued my uncle, I should be able to clear it from all the earthly particles and the shells which are encrusted about it. But I do not possess that valuable solvent. Yet, such as it is, the body shall tell us its own wonderful story. Here the professor laid hold of the fossil skeleton, and handled it with the skill of a dexterous showman. You see, he said, that it is not six feet long, and that we are still separated by a long interval from the pretended race of giants. As to the family to which it belongs, it is evidently Caucasian. It is the white race, our own. The skull of this fossil is a regular oval, or rather, ovoid. It exhibits no prominent cheekbones, no projecting jaws. It presents no appearance of that prognathism which diminishes the facial angle. Measure that angle. It is nearly ninety degrees. But I will go further in my deductions, and I will affirm that this specimen of the human family is of the Japhetic race, which has since spread from the Indies to the Atlantic. Don't smile, gentlemen. Nobody was smiling, but the learned professor was frequently disturbed by the broad smiles provoked by his learned eccentricities. Yes, he pursued with animation, this is a fossil man, the contemporary of the mastodons whose remains fill this amphitheatre. But if you ask me how he came here, how those strata on which he lay slipped down into this enormous hollow in the globe, I confess I cannot answer that question. 
no doubt in this post-tertiary period considerable commotions were still disturbing the crust of the earth the long continued cooling of the globe produced chasms fissures clefts and faults into which very probably portions of the upper earth may have fallen i make no rass assertions but there is the man surrounded by his own works by hatchets by flint arrowheads which are the characteristics of the stone age and unless he came here like myself as a tourist on a visit and as a pioneer of science i can entertain no doubt of the authenticity of his remote origin the professor ceased to speak and the audience broke out into loud and unanimous applause for of course my uncle was right and wiser men than his nephew would have had some trouble to refute his statements another remarkable thing the fossil body was not the only one in this immense catacomb we came upon other bodies at every step amongst this mortal dust and my uncle might select the most curious of these specimens to demolish the incredulity of skeptics in fact it was a wonderful spectacle that of these generations of men and animals commingled in a common cemetery then one very serious question arose presently which we scarcely dared to suggest had all those creatures slided through a great fissure in the crust of the earth down to the shores of the Liedenbrock sea when they were dead and turning to dust or had they lived and grown and died here in this subterranean world under a false sky just like inhabitants of the upper earth until the present time we had seen alive only marine monsters and fishes might not some living man some native of the abyss be yet a wanderer below on this desert strand End of chapter 38 A Journey to the Interior of the Earth by Jules Verne Chapter 39 Forest Scenery Illuminated by Electricity For another half-hour we trod upon a pavement of bones. We pushed on, impelled by our burning curiosity. What other marvels did this cavern contain? What new treasures lay there for science to unfold? I was prepared for any surprise. My imagination was ready for any astonishment, however astounding. We had long since lost sight of the seashore behind the hills of bones. The rash professor, careless of losing his way, hurried me forward. We advanced in silence, bathed in luminous electric fluid. By some phenomenon which I am unable to explain, it lighted up all sides of every object equally. Such was its diffusiveness, there being no central point from which the light emanated, that shadows no longer existed. You might have thought yourself under the rays of a vertical sun in a tropical region at noonday and at the height of summer. No vapour was visible. The rocks, the distant mountains, a few isolated clumps of forest trees in the distance, presented a weird and wonderful aspect under these totally new conditions of a universal diffusion of light. We were like Hoffman's shadowless man. After walking a mile, we reached the outskirts of a vast forest, but not one of those forests of fungi which bordered Port Gräuben. Here was the vegetation of the tertiary period in its fullest blaze of magnificence, tall palms belonging to no species longer living. Splendid palmacites, firs, yews, cypress trees, thujas, representatives of the conifers, were linked together by a tangled network of long climbing plants. A soft carpet of moss and hepaticas luxuriously clothed the soil. A few sparkling streams ran almost in silence under what would have been the shade of the trees, but that there was no shadow. On their banks grew tree ferns similar to those we grow in hothouses but a remarkable feature was the total absence of colour in all those trees, shrubs, and plants, growing without life-giving heat and the light of the sun. Everything seemed mixed up and confounded in one uniform silver-grey or light-brown tint, like that of fading and faded leaves. Not a green leaf anywhere, and the flowers, which were abundant enough in the tertiary period, which first gave birth to flowers, looked like brown paper flowers, without colour or scent. My uncle Liedenbrock ventured to penetrate under this colossal grove. I followed him, not without fear. 
since nature had here provided vegetable nourishment, why should not the terrible mammals be there too? I perceived in the broad clearings left by the trees, decayed with age, leguminous plants, eserini, rubici, and many other eatable shrubs, dear to ruminant animals at every period. Then I observed, mingled together in confusion, trees of countries far apart on the surface of the globe. The oak and the palm were growing side by side, the Australian eucalyptus leaned against the Norwegian pine, the birch tree of the north mingled its foliage with New Zealand cowries. It was enough to distract the most ingenious classifier of terrestrial botany. Suddenly I halted. I drew back my uncle. The diffused light revealed the smallest object in the dense and distant thickets. I thought I had saw, no, I did see, with my own eyes, vast, colossal forms moving amongst the trees. They were gigantic animals. It was a herd of mastodons, not fossil remains, but living, and resembling those the bones of which were found in the marshes of Ohio in 1801. I saw those huge elephants whose long, flexible trunks were grouting and turning up the soil under the trees like a legion of serpents. I could hear the crashing noise of their long ivory tusks boring into the old decaying trunks. The boughs cracked, and the leaves torn away by cartloads went down the cavernous throats of the vast brutes. So then, the dream in which I had had a vision of the prehistoric world, of the tertiary and post-tertiary periods, was now realized. And there we were alone in the bowels of the earth, at the mercy of its wild inhabitants. My uncle was gazing with intense and eager interest. "'Come on,' he said, seizing my arm. "'Forward, forward!' "'No, I will not,' I cried. "'We have no firearms. "'What could we do in the midst of a herd of these four-footed giants? "'Come away, uncle, come. "'No human being may with safety dare the anger of these monstrous beasts.' "'No human creature,' replied my uncle in a lower voice. "'There you are wrong, Axel. "'Look, look down there.' I fancy I see a living creature similar to ourselves. It is a man. I looked, shaking my head incredulously, but though at first I was unbelieving, I had to yield to the evidence of my senses. In fact, at a distance of a quarter of a mile, leaning against the trunk of a gigantic cowrie, stood a human being, the proteus of those subterranean regions, a new son of Neptune, watching this countless herd of mastodons. Imanis pecoris custos, Imanior ipse, that is, the shepherd of gigantic herbs, and huger still himself. Yes, truly, huger still himself. It was no longer a fossil being like those whose dried remains we had easily lifted up in the field of bones. It was a giant, able to control those monsters. In stature he was at least twelve feet high, his head, huge and unshapely as a buffalo's, was half hidden in the thick and tangled growth of his unkempt hair. It most resembled the mane of the primitive elephant. In his hand he wielded with ease an enormous bow, a staff worthy of this shepherd of the geologic period. We stood petrified and speechless with amazement. But he might see us. We must fly. "'Come, do come,' I said to my uncle, who for once allowed himself to be persuaded. In another quarter of an hour our nimble heels had carried us beyond the reach of this horrible monster. And yet, now that I can reflect quietly, now that my spirit has grown calm again, now that months have slipped by since this strange and supernatural meeting, what am I to think? What am I to believe?' I must conclude that it was impossible that our senses had been deceived, that our eyes did not see what we supposed they saw. No human being lives in this subterranean world, no generation of men dwells in those inferior caverns of the globe, unknown to and unconnected with the inhabitants of the surface. It is absurd to believe it. I had rather admit that it may have been some animal whose structure resembled the human, some ape or baboon of the early geological ages, some protopithica 
for Mesopithecus, some early or middle-aged ape like that discovered by Mr. Lartet in the bone cave of saint saul But this creature surpassed in stature all the measurements known in modern paleontology. But that a man, a living man, and therefore whole generations, doubtless besides, should be buried there in the bowels of the earth, is impossible. However, we had left behind us the luminous forest, dumb with astonishment, overwhelmed and struck down with a terror which amounted to stupefaction. We kept running on for fear the horrible monster might be on our track. It was a flight, a fall, like that fearful pulling and dragging which is peculiar to nightmare. Instinctively we got back to the Liedenbrock Sea, and I cannot say into what vagaries my mind would not have carried me but for a circumstance which brought me back to practical matters. Although I was certain that we were now treading upon a soil not hitherto touched by our feet, I often perceived groups of rocks which reminded me of those about Port Gräuben. Besides, this seemed to confirm the indications of the needle, and to show that we had, against our will, returned to the north of the Liedenbrock Sea. Occasionally we felt quite convinced. Brooks and waterfalls were tumbling everywhere from the projections in the rocks. I thought I recognised the bed of Sertibrand, our faithful Hansbach, and the grotto in which I had recovered life and consciousness. Then a few paces further on, the arrangement of the cliffs, the appearance of an unrecognised stream, or the strange outline of a rock, came to throw me again into doubt. I communicated my doubts to my uncle. Like myself he hesitated. He could recognise nothing again amidst this monotonous scene. Evidently, said I, we have not landed again at our original starting point, but the storm has carried us a little higher, and if we follow the shore we shall find Port Gräuben. If that is the case it will be useless to continue our exploration, and we had better return to our raft. But, Axel, are you not mistaken? It is difficult to speak decidedly, Uncle, for all these rocks are so very much alike. Yet I think I recognise the promontory at the foot of which Hans constructed our launch— we must be very near the little port, if indeed this is not it," I added, examining a creek which I thought I recognised. No, Axel, we should at least find our own traces, and I see nothing. But I do see, I cried, darting upon an object lying in the sand. And I showed my uncle a rusty dagger which I had just picked up. Come, said he, had you this weapon with you? I? No, certainly, but you perhaps? "'Not that I am aware,' said the Professor. "'I never had this object in my possession.' "'Well, this is strange.' "'No, Axel, it's very simple. "'The Icelanders often wear arms of this kind. "'This must have belonged to Hans, and he has lost it.' "'I shook my head. "'Hans had never had an object like this in his possession. "'Did it not belong to some pre warrior?' I cried to some living man, contemporary with the huge cattle-driver. But no, this is not a relic of the Stone Age. It's not even of the Iron Age. This blade is steel. My uncle stopped me abruptly on my way to a dissertation which could have taken me a long way, and said coolly, Be calm, Axel, and reasonable. This dagger belongs to the sixteenth century. It is a poniard, such as gentlemen carried in their belts to give the coup de grace. Its origin is Spanish. It was never either yours, or mine, or the hunter's, nor did it belong to any of these human beings who may or may not inhabit this inner world. See, it was never jagged like this by cutting men's throats. Its blade is coated with a rust neither a day, nor a year, nor a hundred years old. The professor was getting excited, according to his wont, and was allowing his imagination to run away with him. Axel, we are on the way towards the grand discovery— this blade has been left on the strand for from one to three hundred years, and has blunted its edge upon the rocks that fringe this subterranean sea. But it has not come alone, it has not twisted itself out of
A Journey to the Interior of the Earth by Jules Verne Chapter 40 Preparations for Blasting a Passage to the Center of the Earth Since the start upon this marvelous pilgrimage, I had been through so many astonishments that I might well be excused for thinking myself well hardened against any further surprise. Yet, at the sight of these two letters, engraved on this spot three hundred years ago, I stood aghast in dumb amazement. Not only were the initials of the learned alchemist visible upon the living rock, but there lay the iron point with which the letters had been engraved. I could no longer doubt of the existence of that wonderful traveller, and of the fact of his unparalleled journey, without the most glaring incredulity. Whilst these reflections were occupying me, Professor Liedenbrock had launched into a somewhat rhapsodical eulogium, of which Arnus Agnusem was, of course, the hero. "'Thou marvellous genius!' he cried, thou hast not forgotten one indication which might serve to lay open to mortals the road through the terrestrial crust, and thy fellow creatures may even now, after the lapse of three centuries, again trace thy footsteps through these deep and darksome ways. You reserved the contemplation of these wonders for other eyes besides your own. Your name, graven from stage to stage, leads the bold follower of your footsteps to the very centre of our planet's core and there again we shall find your own name written with your own hand. I too will inscribe my name upon this dark granite page. But forever henceforth let this cape that advances into the sea discovered by yourself be known by your own illustrious name, Cape Saknussem. Such were the glowing words of the panegyric which fell upon my attentive ear, and I could not resist the sentiment of enthusiasm with which I too was infected. The fire of zeal kindled afresh in me. I forgot everything. I dismissed from my mind the past perils of the journey, the future danger of our return. That which another had done I supposed we might also do, and nothing that was not superhuman appeared impossible to me. Forward! Forward! I cried. I was already darting down the gloomy tunnel when the professor stopped me. He, the man of impulse, counselled patience and coolness. "'Let us first return to Hans,' he said, "'and bring the raft to this spot.' I obeyed, not without dissatisfaction, and passed out rapidly among the rocks on the shore. I said, "'Uncle, do you know? It seems to me that circumstances have wonderfully befriended us hitherto.' "'Do you think so, Axel?' No doubt. Even the tempest has put us on the right way. Blessings on that storm. It has brought us back to this coast from which fine weather would have carried us far away. Suppose we had touched with our prow, the prow of a rudder, the southern shore of the Liedenbrock Sea. What would have become of us? We should never have seen the name of Saknusem, and we should at this moment be imprisoned on a rock-bound, impassable coast. Yes, Axel, it is providential that whilst supposing we were steering south, we should have just got back north at Cape Sagnusem. I must say that it is astonishing, and that I feel I have no way to explain it. What does that signify, Uncle? Our business is not to explain facts, but to use them. Certainly, but... Well, Uncle, we are going to resume the northern route, and to pass under the north countries of Europe under Sweden, Russia, Siberia, who knows where, instead of burrowing under the deserts of Africa, or perhaps the waves of the Atlantic. And that is all I want to know. Yes, Axel, you are right. It is all for the best, since we have left that weary horizontal sea which led us nowhere. Now we shall go down, down, down. Do you know that it is now only fifteen hundred leagues to the centre of the globe? Is that all? I cried. Why, that's nothing. Let us start. March! All this crazy talk was going on still when we met the hunter. Everything was made ready for our instant departure. Every bit of cordage was put on board. We took our places, and with our sails set, Hans steered us along the coast to Cape Sacknusem. The wind was unfavourable to a species of launch not calculated for shallow water. 
In many places we were obliged to push ourselves along with iron-pointed sticks. Often the sunken rocks just beneath the surface obliged us to deviate from our straight course. At last, after three hours' sailing, about six in the evening, we reached a place suitable for our landing. I jumped ashore, followed by my uncle and the Icelander. This short passage had not served to cool my ardour. On the contrary, I even proposed to burn our ship, to prevent the possibility of return. But my uncle would not consent to that. I thought him singularly lukewarm. At least, I said, don't let us lose a minute. Yes, yes, lad, he replied. But first let us examine this new gallery, to see if it shall require our ladders. My uncle put his room coughs apparatus in action. The raft moored to the shore was left alone, the mouth of the tunnel was not twenty yards from us, and our party, with myself at the head, made for it without a moment's delay. The aperture, which was almost round, was about five feet in diameter. The dark passage was cut out in the live rock, and lined with a coat of the eruptive matter which formerly issued from it. The interior was level with the ground outside, so that we were able to enter without difficulty. We were following a horizontal plane, when only six paces in, our progress was interrupted by an enormous block just across our way. A cursed rock, I cried in a passion, finding myself suddenly confronted by an impassable obstacle. Right and left we searched in vain for a way, up and down, side to side. There was no getting any further. I felt fearfully disappointed, and I would not admit that the obstacle was final. I stopped. I looked underneath the block. No opening. Above. Granite still. Hans passed his lamp over every portion of the barrier in vain. We must give up all hope of passing it. I sat down in despair. My uncle strode from side to side in the narrow passage. "'But how was it with Saknusem?' I cried. "'Yes,' said my uncle. "'Was he stopped by this stone barrier?' "'No, no,' I replied with animation. "'This fragment of rock has been shaken down by some shock or convulsion, "'or by one of those magnetic storms which agitate these regions, "'and has blocked up the passage which lay open to him. "'Many years have elapsed since the return of Saknusem to the surface, "'and the fall of this huge fragment.' Is it not evident that this gallery was once the way open to the course of the lava, and that at that time there must have been a free passage? See, here are the recent fissures grooving and channelling the granite roof. This roof itself is formed of fragments of rock carried down, of enormous stones, as if some by giant's hand. But at one time the expulsive force was greater than usual, and this block, like the falling keystone of a ruined arch, has slipped down to the ground and blocked up the way. It is only an accidental obstruction, not met by Sacknesson, and if we don't destroy it, we shall be unworthy to reach the centre of the earth. Such was my sentence. The soul of the professor had passed into me. The genius of discovery possessed me wholly. I forgot the past. I scorned the future. I gave not a thought to the things of the surface of this globe into which I had dived. Its cities and its sunny plains, Hamburg and the Königstrasse, even poor Gräuben, who must have given us up for lost. All were for the time dismissed from the pages of my memory. "'Well,' cried my uncle, "'let us make away with our pickaxes. "'Too hard for the pickaxe. "'Well, then, the spade. "'That would take us too long. "'What, then? "'Why, gunpowder, to be sure. "'Let us mine the obstacle and blow it up. "'Oh, yes, it is only a bit of rock to blast. "'Hans, to work!' cried my uncle. "'The Icelander returned to the raft, "'and soon came back with an iron bar, "'which he made use of to bore a hole for the charge. "'This was no easy work. "'A hole was to be made large enough
A Journey to the Interior of the Earth by Jules Verne Chapter 41 The Great Explosion and the Rush Down Below The next day, Thursday, August 27th, is a well-remembered date in our subterranean journey. It never returns to my memory without sending through me a shudder of horror and a palpitation of the heart. From that hour we had no further occasion for the exercise of reason, or judgment, or skill, or contrivance. We were henceforth to be hurled along the playthings of the fierce elements of the deep. At six we were afoot. The moment drew near to clear away by blasting through the opposing mass of granite. I begged for the honour of lighting the fuse. This duty done, I was to join my companions on the raft, which had not yet been unloaded. We should then push off as far as we could and avoid the dangers arising from the explosion, the effects of which were not likely to be confined to the rock itself. The fuse was calculated to burn ten minutes before setting fire to the mine. I therefore had sufficient time to get away to the raft. I prepared to fulfil my task with some anxiety. After a hasty meal, my uncle and the hunter embarked, whilst I remained on shore. I was supplied with a lighted lantern to set fire to the fuse. "'Now go,' said my uncle, "'and return immediately to us.' "'Don't be uneasy,' I replied. "'I will not play by the way.' I immediately proceeded to the mouth of the tunnel. I opened my lantern. I laid hold of the end of the match. The professor stood, chronometer in hand. "'Ready?' he cried. "'Aye. Fire!' I instantly plunged the end of the fuse into the lantern. It spluttered and flamed, and I ran at the top of my speed to the raft. "'Come on board quickly, and let us push off!' Hands, with a vigorous thrust, sent us from the shore. The raft shot twenty fathoms out to sea. It was a moment of intense excitement. The professor was watching the hand of the chronometer. Five minutes more,' he said. Four. Three. My pulse beat half seconds. Two. One. Down, granite rocks, down with you. What took place at that moment? I believe I did not hear the dull roar of the explosion. But the rocks suddenly assumed a new arrangement. They rent asunder like a curtain. I saw a bottomless pit open on the shore. The sea, lashed into sudden fury, rose up in an enormous billow, on the ridge of which the unhappy raft was uplifted bodily in the air with all its crew and cargo. We all three fell down flat. In less than a second we were in deep, unfathomable darkness. Then I felt as if not only myself but the raft also had no support beneath. I thought it was sinking, but it was not so. I wanted to speak to my uncle, but the roaring of the waves prevented him from hearing even the sound of my voice. In spite of darkness, noise, astonishment, and terror, I then understood what had taken place. On the other side of the blown-up rock was an abyss. The explosion had caused a kind of earthquake in this fissured and abysmal region. A great gulf had opened, and the sea, now changed into a torrent, was hurrying us along into it. I gave myself up for lost. An hour passed away, two hours perhaps, I cannot tell. We clutched each other fast, to save ourselves from being thrown off the raft. We felt violent shocks whenever we were borne heavily against the craggy projections. Yet these shocks were not very frequent, from which I concluded that the gully was widening. It was no doubt the same road that Sagnusem had taken, but instead of walking peaceably down it, as he had done, we were carrying a whole sea along with us. These ideas, it will be understood, presented themselves to my mind in a vague and undetermined form. I had difficulty in associating my ideas together during this headlong race, which seemed like a vertical descent. To judge by the air which was whistling past me and made a whizzing in my ears, we were moving faster than the fastest express trains. To light a torch under these conditions would have been impossible and our last electric apparatus had been shattered by the force of the explosion. I was therefore much surprised to see a clear light shining near me. 
It lighted up the calm and unmoved countenance of Hans. The skilful huntsman had succeeded in lighting the lantern, and although it flickered so much as to threaten to go out, it threw a fitful light across the awful darkness. I was right in my supposition. It was a wide gallery. The dim light could not show us both its walls at once. The fall of the waters which were carrying us away exceeded that of the swiftest rapids in American rivers. Its surface seemed composed of a sheaf of arrows hurled with inconceivable force. I cannot convey my impressions by a better comparison. The raft, occasionally seized by an eddy, spun round as it still flew along. When it approached the walls of the gallery, I threw on them the light of the lantern, and I could judge somewhat of the velocity of our speed by noticing how the jagged projections of the rocks spun into endless ribbons and bands, so that we seemed confined within a network of shifting lines. I suppose we were running at a rate of thirty leagues an hour. My uncle and I gazed on each other with haggard eyes, clinging to the stump of the mast, which had snapped us under at the first shock of our great catastrophe. We kept our backs to the wind, not to be stifled by the rapidity of movement which no human power could check. Hours passed away, no change in our situation, but a discovery came to complicate matters and make them worse. In seeking to put our cargo into somewhat better order, I found that the greater part of the articles embarked had disappeared at the moment of the explosion, when the sea broke in upon us with such violence. I wanted to know exactly what we had saved, and with the lantern in my hand I began my examination. Of our instruments, none were saved but the compass and the chronometer. Our stock of ropes and ladders was reduced to a bit of cord rolled around the stump of the mast. Not a spade, not a pickaxe, not a hammer was left us, and, irreparable disaster, we had only one day's provisions left. I searched every nook and corner, every crack and cranny in the raft. There was nothing. Our provisions were reduced to one bit of salt meat and a few biscuits. I stared at our failing supplies stupidly. I refused to take in the gravity of our loss. And yet what was the use of troubling myself? If we had had provisions enough for months, how could we get out of the abyss into which we were being hurled by an irresistible torrent? Why should we fear the horrors of famine when death was swooping down upon us in a multitude of other forms? Would there be time left to die of starvation? Yet by an inexplicable play of the imagination I forgot my present dangers to contemplate the threatening future. Was there any chance of escaping from the fury of this impetuous torrent, and of returning to the surface of the globe? I could not form the slightest conjecture how or when, but one chance in a thousand or ten thousand is still a chance, whilst death from starvation would leave us not the smallest hope in the world. The thought came into my mind to declare the whole truth to my uncle, to show him the dreadful straits to which we were reduced, and to calculate how long we might yet expect to live. But I had the courage to preserve silence. I wished to leave him cool and self-possessed. At that moment the light from our lantern began to sink by little and little, and then went out entirely. The wick had burnt itself out. Black night reigned again, and there was no hope left of being able to dissipate the palpable darkness. We had yet one torch left, but we could not have kept it alight. Then, like a child, I closed my eyes firmly not to see the darkness. After a considerable lapse of time our speed redoubled. I could perceive it by the sharpness of the currents that blew past my face. The descent became steeper. I believe we were no longer sliding, but falling down. I had an impression that we were
A Journey to the Interior of the Earth by Jules Verne. Chapter 42 Headlong Speed Upward Through the Horrors of Darkness It might have been, as I guessed, about ten at night. The first of my senses which came into play after this last bout was that of hearing. All at once I could hear, and it was a real exercise of the sense of hearing. I could hear the silence in the gallery after the din which for hours had stunned me. At last these words of my uncle's came to me like a vague murmuring. "'We are going up.' "'What do you mean?' I cried. "'Yes, we are going up, up.' I stretched out my arm, I touched the wall, and drew back my hand bleeding. We were ascending with extreme rapidity. "'The torch, the torch!' cried the professor. Not without difficulty, Hans succeeded in lighting the torch, and the flame, preserving its upward tendency, threw enough light to show us what kind of a place we were in. "'Just as I thought,' said the professor. "'We are in a tunnel not four and twenty feet in diameter. The water had reached the bottom of the gulf. It is now rising to its level, and carrying us with it.' "'Where to?' "'I cannot tell.' but we must be ready for anything. We are mounting at a speed which seems to me of fourteen feet in a second, or ten miles an hour. At this rate we shall get on. Yes, if nothing stops us, if this well has an aperture. But suppose it to be stopped. If the air is condensed by the pressure of this column of water, we shall be crushed. Axel, replied the professor with perfect coolness, our situation is almost desperate, but there are some chances of deliverance, and it is these that I am considering. If at every instant we may perish, so at every instant we may be saved. Let us then be prepared to seize upon the smallest advantage. But what shall we do now? Recruit our strength by eating. At these words I fixed a haggard eye upon my uncle. That which I had been so unwilling to confess, at last had to be told. Eat, did you say? Yes, at once. The professor added a few words in Danish, but Hans shook his head mournfully. What? cried my uncle. Have we lost our provisions? Yes, here is all we have left. One bit of salt meat, for the three. My uncle stared at me, as if he could not understand. "'Well,' said I, "'do you think we have any chance of being saved?' My question was unanswered. An hour passed away. I began to feel the pangs of a violent hunger. My companions were suffering, too, and not one of us dared touch this wretched remnant of our goodly store. But now we were mounting up with excessive speed— Sometimes the air would cut our breath short, as is experienced by aeronauts ascending too rapidly. But whilst they suffer from cold in proportion to their rise, we were beginning to feel a contrary effect. The heat was rising in a manner to cause us the most fearful anxiety, and certainly the temperature was at this moment at the height of one hundred degrees Fahrenheit. What could be the meaning of such a change? Up to this time facts had supported the theories of Davy and of Liedenbrock. Until now particular conditions of non-conducting rocks, electricity and magnetism, had tempered the laws of nature, giving us only a moderately warm climate. For the theory of a central fire remained in my estimation the only one that was true and explicable. Were we then turning back to where the phenomena of central heat ruled in all their rigour, and would reduce the most refractory rocks to the state of a molten liquid? I feared this, and said to the professor, "'If we are neither drowned, nor shattered to pieces, nor starved to death, there is still the chance that we may be burned alive and reduced to ashes.' At this he shrugged his shoulders, and returned to his thoughts. An hour passed, and, except some slight increase in the temperature, nothing new had happened. "'Come,' said he, 
"'We must determine upon something.' "'Determine on what?' said I. "'Yes, we must recruit our strength by carefully rationing ourselves, "'and so prolong our existence by a few hours. "'But we shall be reduced to very great weakness at last. "'And our last hour is not far off.' "'Well, if there is a chance of safety, "'if a moment for active exertion presents itself, "'where should we find the required strength "'if we allowed ourselves to be enfeebled by hunger? "'Well, uncle, when this bit of meat has been devoured, "'what shall we have left?' "'Nothing, Axel, nothing at all. "'But will it do you any more good to devour it with your eyes "'than with your teeth? "'Your reasoning has in it neither sense nor energy.' "'Then don't you despair?' I cried irritably. "'No, certainly not,' was the professor's firm reply. "'What? Do you think there is any chance of safety left?' "'Yes, I do. As long as the heart beats, as long as body and soul keep together, I cannot admit that any creature endowed with a will has need to despair of life.' "'Resolute words, these!' The man who could speak so, under such circumstances, was of no ordinary type. "'Finally, what do you mean to do?' I asked. "'Eat what is left to the last crumb, and recruit our fading strength. This meal will be our last, perhaps, so let it be. But, at any rate, we shall once more be men, and not exhausted empty bags. "'Well, let us consume it, then.' I cried. My uncle took the piece of meat and the few biscuits which had escaped from the general destruction. He divided them into three equal portions, and gave one to each. This made about a pound of nourishment for each. The professor ate his greedily, with a kind of feverish rage. I ate without pleasure, almost with disgust. Hans, quietly, moderately, masticating his small mouthfuls without any noise, and relishing them with the calmness of a man above all anxiety about the future. By diligent search he had found a flask of Hollands. He offered it to us each in turn, and this generous beverage cheered us up slightly. Fortreflich, said Hans, drinking in his turn. Excellent, replied my uncle. A glimpse of hope had returned, although without cause. But our last meal was over, and it was now five in the morning. Man is so constituted that health is a purely negative state. Hunger once satisfied, it is difficult for a man to imagine the horrors of starvation. They cannot be understood without being felt. Therefore it was that after our long fast these few mouthfuls of meat and biscuit made us triumph over our past agonies. But as soon as the meal was done, we each of us fell deep into thought. What was Hans thinking of, that man of the far west, but who seemed ruled by the fatalist doctrines of the east? As for me, my thoughts were made up of remembrances— and they carried me up to the surface of the globe of which I ought never to have taken leave. The house in the Königstrasse, my poor dear Gräuben, that kind soul Martha, flitted like visions before my eyes, and in the dismal moanings which from time to time reached my ears, I thought I could distinguish the roar of the traffic of the great cities upon earth. My uncle still had his eye upon his work. Torch in hand, he tried to gather some idea of our situation from the observation of the strata. This calculation could, at best, be but a vague approximation, but a learned man is always a philosopher when he succeeds in remaining cool, and assuredly Professor Liedenbrock possessed this quality to a surprising degree. I could hear him murmuring geological terms. I could understand them, and in spite of myself I felt interested— in this last geological study. "'Eruptive granite,' he was saying. "'We are still in the primitive period, but we are going up, up, higher still. Who can tell?' "'Ah, who can tell?' With his hand he was examining the perpendicular wall, 
and in a few more minutes he continued, "'This is Gneiss. Here is Micah Schist. Ah, presently we shall come to the transition period, and then—' What did the professor mean? Could he be trying to measure the thickness of the crust of the earth that lay between us and the world above? Had he any means of making this calculation? No, he had not the aneroid, and no guessing could supply its place. Still the temperature kept rising, and I felt myself steeped in a broiling atmosphere. I could only compare it to the heat of a furnace at the moment when the molten metal is running into the mould. Gradually we had been obliged to throw aside our coats and waistcoats. The lightest covering became uncomfortable and even painful. "'Are we rising into a fiery furnace?' I cried at one moment, when the heat was redoubling. "'No,' replied my uncle, "'that is impossible, quite impossible.' "'Yet,' I answered, feeling the wall, "'this well is burning hot.' At the same moment, touching the water, I had to withdraw my hand in haste. "'The water is scalding,' I cried. This time the professor's only answer was an angry gesture. Then an unconquerable terror seized upon me, from which I could no longer get free. I felt that a catastrophe was approaching before which the boldest spirit must quail. A dim, vague notion laid hold of my mind, but which was fast hardening into certainty. I tried to repel it, but it would return. I dared not express it in plain terms. Yet a few involuntary observations confirmed me in my view. By the flickering light of the torch I could distinguish contortions in the granite beds. A phenomenon was unfolding in which electricity would play the principal part. Then this unbearable heat, this boiling water. I consulted the compass. The compass had lost its properties. It had ceased to act properly. End of chapter 42 Recorded on November 14th 2005, in Oceanside, California. A Journey to the Interior of the Earth by Jules Verne Chapter 43 Shot out of a volcano at last. Yes, our compass was no longer a guide. The needle flew from pole to pole with a kind of frenzied impulse. It ran round the dial and spun hither and thither, as if it were giddy or intoxicated. I knew quite well that, according to the best-received theories, the mineral covering of the globe is never at absolute rest. The changes brought about by the chemical decomposition of its component parts, the agitation caused by great liquid torrents, and the magnetic currents are continually tending to disturb it, even when living beings upon its surface may fancy that all is quiet below. A phenomenon of this kind would not have greatly alarmed me, or, at any rate, it would not have given rise to dreadful apprehensions. But other facts, other circumstances of a peculiar nature, came to reveal to me by degrees the true state of the case. There came incessant and continuous explosions— I could only compare them to the loud rattle of a long train of chariots driven at full speed over the stones, or a roar of unintermitting thunder. Then the disordered compass, thrown out of gear by the electric currents, confirmed me in a growing conviction. The mineral crust of the globe threatened to burst up, the granite foundations to come together with a crash— the fissure through which we were helplessly driven would be filled up, the void would be full of crushed fragments of rock, and we poor wretched mortals were to be buried and annihilated in this dreadful consummation. "'My uncle!' I cried. "'We are lost now, utterly lost!' "'What are you in a fright about now?' was the calm rejoinder. "'What is the matter with you?' "'The matter! Look at those quaking walls! Look at those shivering rocks! Don't you feel the burning heat? Don't you see how the water boils and bubbles? Are you blind? 
to the dense vapours and steam growing thicker and denser every minute? See this agitated compass needle. It is an earthquake that is threatening us. My undaunted uncle calmly shook his head. Do you think, said he, an earthquake is coming? I do. Well, I think you are mistaken. What? Don't you recognize the symptoms? Of an earthquake? No, I am looking out for something better. What can you mean? Explain. It is an eruption, Axel. An eruption? Do you mean to affirm that we are running up the shaft of a volcano? I believe we are, said the indomitable professor, with an air of perfect self-possession. And it is the best thing that could possibly happen to us under our circumstances. The best thing? Was my uncle Stark mad? What did the man mean? And what was the use of saying facetious things at a time like this? What? I shouted. Are we being taken up in an eruption? Our fate has flung us here among burning lavas, molten rocks, boiling waters, and all kinds of volcanic matter. We are going to be pitched out, expelled, tossed up, vomited, spit out high into the air, along with fragments of rock, showers of ashes and scoria, in the midst of a towering rush of smoke and flames. And it is the best thing that could happen to us? Yes. "'replied the professor, eyeing me over his spectacles. "'I don't see any other way of reaching the surface of the earth. "'I pass rapidly over the thousand ideas which passed through my mind. "'My uncle was right, undoubtedly right, "'and never had he seemed to me more daring and more confirmed in his notions "'than at this moment when he was calmly contemplating the chances "'of being shot out of a volcano.' In the meantime, up we went. The night passed away in continual ascent. The din and uproar around us became more and more intensified. I was stifled and stunned. I thought my last hour was approaching, and yet imagination is such a strong thing, that even in this supreme hour I was occupied with strange and almost childish speculations." but I was the victim, not the master, of my own thoughts. It was very evident that we were being hurried upward upon the crest of a wave of eruption. Beneath our raft were boiling waters, and under these the more sluggish lava was working its way up in a heated mass, together with shoals of fragments of rock which, when they arrived at the crater, would be dispersed in all directions, high and low. We were imprisoned in the shaft or chimney of some volcano. There was no room to doubt of that. But this time, instead of Snaefell, an extinct volcano, we were inside one in full activity. I wondered, therefore, where could this mountain be, and in what part of the world we were to be shot out. I made no doubt but that it would be in some northern region— before its disorders set in, the needle had never deviated from that direction. From Cape Saknussem we had been carried due north for hundreds of leagues. Were we under Iceland again? Were we destined to be thrown up out of Hecla, or by which of the seven other fiery craters in that island? Within a radius of five hundred leagues to the west, I remembered under this parallel of latitude only the imperfectly known volcanoes of the northeast coast of America. To the east there was only one in the eightieth degree of north latitude, the Esk, in Jan Mayen Island, not far from Spitsbergen. Certainly there was no lack of craters, and there were some capacious enough to throw out a whole army but I wanted to know which of them was to serve us for an exit from the inner world. Towards morning the ascending movement became accelerated. If the heat increased, instead of diminishing, as we approached nearer to the surface of the globe, this effect was due to local causes alone, and those volcanic. The manner of our locomotion left no doubt in my mind. An enormous force— 
a force of hundreds of atmospheres generated by the extreme pressure of confined vapours was driving us irresistibly forward but to what numberless dangers it exposed us soon lurid lights began to penetrate the vertical gallery which widened as we went up right and left i could see deep channels like huge tunnels out of which escaped dense volumes of smoke tongues of fire lapped the walls which crackled and sputtered under the intense heat see see my uncle i cried well those are only sulphurous flames and vapours which one must expect to see in an eruption they are quite natural but suppose they should wrap us round but they won't wrap us round but we shall be stifled we shall not be stifled at all the gallery is widening and if it becomes necessary we shall abandon the raft and creep into a crevice but the water the rising water there is no more water axel only a lava paste which is bearing us up on its surface to the top of the crater the liquid column had indeed disappeared to give place to dense and still boiling eruptive matter of all kinds the temperature was becoming unbearable a thermometer exposed to this atmosphere would have marked one hundred fifty degrees the perspiration streamed from my body but for the rapidity of our ascent we should have been suffocated but the professor gave up his idea of abandoning the raft and it was well he did however roughly joined together those planks afforded us a firmer support than we could have found anywhere else about eight in the morning a new incident occurred the upward movement ceased the raft lay motionless what is this i asked shaken by this sudden stoppage as if by a shock it is a halt replied my uncle is the eruption checked i asked i hope not i rose and tried to look around me perhaps the raft itself stopped in its course by a projection was staying the volcanic torrent if this were the case we should have to release it as soon as possible but it was not so the blast of ashes scorix and rubbish had ceased to rise has the eruption stopped I cried. Ah, said my uncle, between his clenched teeth, you are afraid, but don't alarm yourself. This lull cannot last long. It has lasted now five minutes, and in a short time we shall resume our journey to the mouth of the crater. As he spoke, the professor continued to consult his chronometer, and he was again right in his prognostications. The raft was soon hurried and driven forward with a rapid but irregular movement, which lasted about ten minutes, and then stopped again. "'Very good,' said my uncle. "'In ten minutes more we shall be off again, for our present business lies with an intermittent volcano. It gives us time now and then to take a breath.' This was perfectly true. When the ten minutes were over, we started off again with renewed and increased speed. We were obliged to lay fast hold of the planks of the raft, not to be thrown off. Then again the paroxysm was over. I have since reflected upon this singular phenomenon, without being able to explain it. At any rate, it was clear that we were not in the main shaft of the volcano, but in a lateral gallery where there were felt recurrent tunes of reaction. How often this operation was repeated I cannot say. All I know is, that at each fresh impulse we were hurled forward with a greatly increased force, and we seemed as if we were mere projectiles. During the short halts we were stifled with the heat. Whilst we were being projected forward the hot air almost stopped my breath. I thought for a moment how delightful it would be to find myself carried suddenly into the Arctic regions, with a cold thirty degrees below the freezing point. My overheated brain conjured up visions of white plains of cool snow, where I might roll and allay my feverish heat. 
little by little my brain, weakened by so many constantly repeated shocks, seemed to be giving way altogether. But for the strong arm of Hans, I should more than once have had my head broken against the granite roof of our burning dungeon. I have therefore no exact recollection of what took place during the following hours. I have a confused impression left of continuous explosions, loud detonations, a general shaking of the rocks all around us, and of a spinning movement with which our raft was once whirled helplessly around. It rocked upon the lava torrent amidst a dense fall of ashes. Snorting flames darted their fiery tongues at us. There were wild, fierce puffs of stormy wind from below, resembling the blasts of vast iron furnaces blowing all at one time. And I caught a glimpse of the figure of Hans lighted up by the fire, and all the feeling I had left was just what I imagine must be the feeling of an unhappy criminal doomed to be blown away alive from the mouth of a cannon, just before the trigger is pulled, and the flying limbs and rags of flesh and skin fill the quivering air, and spatter the blood-stained ground. End of chapter 43 Recorded on November 14th, 2005 in Oceanside, California. A Journey to the Interior of the Earth by Jules Verne Chapter 44 Sunny Lands in the Blue Mediterranean When I opened my eyes again, I felt myself grasped by the belt with the strong hand of our guide. With the other arm he supported my uncle. I was not seriously hurt, but I was shaken and bruised, and battered all over. I found myself lying on the sloping side of a mountain, only two yards from a gaping gulf, which would have swallowed me up had I leaned at all that way. Hans had saved me from death whilst I lay rolling on the edge of the crater. "'Where are we?' asked my uncle irascibly, as if he felt much injured by being landed upon the earth again. The hunter shook his head in token of complete ignorance. "'Is it Iceland?' I asked. "'Nej,' replied Hans. "'What? Not Iceland?' cried the professor. "'Hans must be mistaken,' I said, raising myself up. This was our final surprise after all the astonishing events of our wonderful journey. I had expected to see a white cone covered with the eternal snow of ages rising from the midst of the barren deserts of the icy north, faintly lighted with the pale rays of the Arctic sun, far away in the highest latitudes known. But contrary to all our expectations, my uncle, the Icelander, and myself were sitting halfway down a mountain, baked under the burning rays of a southern sun which was blistering us with the heat and blinding us with the fierce light of his nearly vertical rays. I could not believe my own eyes, but the heated air and the sensation of burning left me no room for doubt. We had come out of the crater half-naked, and the radiant orb to which we had been strangers for two months was lavishing upon us out of his blazing splendours more of his light and heat than we were able to receive with comfort. When my eyes had become accustomed to the bright light to which they had been so long strangers, I began to use them to set my imagination right. At least I would have it to be Spitzbergen, and I was in no humour to give up this notion. The professor was the first to speak, and said, "'Well, this is not much like Iceland.' "'But is it Jan Mayen?' I asked. "'Nor that either,' he answered. This is no northern mountain. Here are no granite peaks capped with snow. Look, Axel, look. Above our heads, at a height of five hundred feet or more, we saw the crater of a volcano, through which, at intervals of fifteen minutes or so, there issued with loud explosions lofty columns of fire, mingled with pumice stones, ashes, and flowing lava. I could feel the heaving of the mountain, which seemed to breathe like a huge whale, and puff out fire and wind from its vast blowholes. 
Beneath, down a pretty steep declivity, ran streams of lava for eight or nine hundred feet, giving the mountain a height of about thirteen hundred or fourteen hundred feet. But the base of the mountain was hidden in a perfect bower of rich verdure, amongst which I was able to distinguish the olive, the fig, and vines, covered with their luscious purple bunches. I was forced to confess that there was nothing arctic here. When the eye passed beyond these green surroundings, it rested on a wide blue expanse of sea or lake, which appeared to enclose this enchanting island within a compass of only a few leagues. Eastward lay a pretty little white seaport town or village, with a few houses scattered around it, and in the harbour of which a few vessels of peculiar rig were gently swayed by the softly swelling waves. Beyond it groups of islets rose from the smooth blue waters, but in such numbers that they seemed to dot the sea like a shoal. To the west distant coasts lined the dim horizon. On some rose blue mountains of smooth undulating forms. On a more distant coast arose a prodigious cone crowned on its summit with a snowy plume of white cloud. To the northward lay spread a vast sheet of water, sparkling and dancing under the hot bright rays, the uniformity broken here and there by the topmast of a gallant ship appearing above the horizon, or a swelling sail moving slowly before the wind. This unforeseen spectacle was most charming to eyes long used to underground darkness. "'Where are we? Where are we?' I asked faintly. Hans closed his eyes with lazy indifference. What did it matter to him? My uncle looked round with dumb surprise. "'Well, whatever mountain this may be,' he said at last, "'it is very hot here. The explosions are going on still, and I don't think it would look well to have come out by an eruption, and then to get our heads broken by bits of falling rock. Let us get down. Then we shall know better what we are about.' Besides, I am starving and parching with thirst. Decidedly the professor was not given to contemplation. For my part, I could for another hour or two have forgotten my hunger and my fatigue to enjoy the lovely scene before me, but I had to follow my companions. The slope of the volcano was in many places of great steepness. We slid down screes of ashes, carefully avoiding the lava-streams which glided sluggishly by us like fiery serpents. As we went I chattered and asked all sorts of questions as to our whereabouts, for I was too much excited not to talk a great deal. "'We are in Asia,' I cried, "'on the coasts of India, in the Malay Islands, or in Oceania. We have passed through half the globe, and come out nearly at the Antipodes.' "'But the compass,' said my uncle. "'Aye, the compass,' I said, greatly puzzled. "'According to the compass we have gone northward.' "'Has it lied?' "'Surely not. Could it lie?' "'Unless, indeed, this is the North Pole.' "'Oh, no, it is not the Pole, but—' "'Well, here was something that baffled us completely. "'I could not tell what to say.' But now we were coming into that delightful greenery, and I was suffering greatly from hunger and thirst. Happily, after two hours' walking, a charming country lay open before us, covered with olive trees, pomegranate trees, and delicious vines, all of which seemed to belong to anybody who pleased to claim them. Besides, in our state of destitution and famine, we were not likely to be particular. Oh! the inexpressible pleasure of pressing those cool sweet fruits to our lips, and eating grapes by mouthfuls off the rich full bunches. Not far off, in the grass, under the delicious shade of the trees, I discovered a spring of fresh cool water, in which we luxuriously bathed our faces, hands, and feet. Whilst we were thus enjoying the sweets of repose, a child appeared out of a grove of olive-trees. "'Ah!' I cried. 
here is an inhabitant of this happy land. It was but a poor boy, miserably ill-clad, a sufferer from poverty, and our aspect seemed to alarm him a great deal. In fact, only half-clothed, with ragged hair and beards, we were a suspicious-looking party, and if the people of the country knew anything about thieves, we were very likely to frighten them. Just as the poor little wretch was going to take to his heels, Hans caught hold of him and brought him to us, kicking and struggling. My uncle began to encourage him as well as he could, and said to him in good German, Was heißt diesen Berg, mein Knablein? Sage mir geschwind. What is this mountain called, my little friend? The child made no answer. Very well, said my uncle. I infer that we are not in Germany. He put the same question in English. We got no forwarder. I was a good deal puzzled. Is the child dumb? cried the professor, who, proud of his knowledge of many languages, now tried French. Comment? Appelez-en ce montagne, mon enfant. Silence still. Now let us try Italian, said my uncle, and he said, Dove noi siamo? Yes, where are we? I impatiently repeated. But there was no answer still. Will you speak when you are told? exclaimed my uncle, shaking the urchin by the ears. Come si noma questa isola? Stromboli, replied the little herd-boy, slipping out of Hans's hands, and scudding into the plain across the olive-trees. We were hardly thinking of that. Stromboli! What an effect this unexpected name produced upon my mind! We were in the midst of the Mediterranean Sea, on an island of the Aeolian archipelago, in the ancient Strongyle, where Aeolus kept the winds and storms chained up, to be let loose at his will. And those distant blue mountains in the east were the mountains of Calabria, and that threatening volcano far away in the south was the fierce Etna. Stromboli! Stromboli! I repeated. My uncle kept time to my exclamations with hands and feet, as well as with words. We seemed to be chanting in chorus. What a journey we had accomplished! How marvellous! Having entered by one volcano, we had issued out of another more than two thousand miles from Snaefell and from that barren, far-away Iceland. The strange chances of our expedition had carried us into the heart of the fairest region in the world. We had exchanged the bleak regions of perpetual snow and of impenetrable barriers of ice for those of brightness, and the rich hues of all glorious things. We had left over our heads the murky sky and cold fogs of the frigid zone to revel under the azure sky of Italy. After our delicious repast of fruits and cold clear water, we set off again to reach the port of Stromboli. It would not have been wise to tell how we came there. The superstitious Italians would have set us down for fire-devils vomited out of hell, so we presented ourselves in the humble guise of shipwrecked mariners. It was not so glorious, but it was safer. On my way I could hear my uncle murmuring, "'But the compass! That compass! It pointed due north! How are we to explain that fact?' "'My opinion is,' I replied disdainfully, that it is best not to explain it. That is the easiest way to shelve the difficulty. Indeed, sir, the occupant of a professorial chair at the Johanneum unable to explain the reason of a cosmical phenomenon. Why, it would be simply disgraceful. And as he spoke, my uncle, half undressed, in rags, a perfect scarecrow, with his leathern belt around him, settling his spectacles upon his nose, and looking learned and imposing, was himself again, the terrible German professor of mineralogy. One hour after we had left the groves of olives, we arrived at the little port of San Vicenzo, where Hans claimed his thirteen weeks' wages, which was counted out to him with a hearty shaking of hands all round. 
At that moment, if he did not share our natural emotion, at least his countenance expanded in a manner very unusual with him, and while with the ends of his fingers he lightly pressed our hands, I believe he smiled. End of chapter 44 Recorded on November 14th, 2005 in Oceanside, California. A Journey to the Interior of the Earth by Jules Verne Chapter 45 All's Well That Ends Well Such is the conclusion of a history which I cannot expect everybody to believe, for some people will believe nothing against the testimony of their own experience. However, I am indifferent to their incredulity, and they may believe as much or as little as they please. The Stromboliotes received us kindly as shipwrecked mariners. They gave us food and clothing. After waiting forty-eight hours, on the thirty-first of August a small craft took us to Messina, where a few days' rest completely removed the effect of our fatigues. On Friday, September the fourth, we embarked on the steamer Volturno, employed by the French Messageries Imperialis, and in three days more we were at Marseilles, having no care on our minds except that abominable deceitful compass, which we had mislaid somewhere, and could not now examine. But its inexplicable behaviour exercised my mind fearfully. On the ninth of September, in the evening, we arrived at Hamburg, I cannot describe to you the astonishment of Martha, or the joy of Gräuben. "'Now you are a hero, Axel,' said to me my blushing fiancé, my betrothed. "'You will not leave me again.' I looked tenderly upon her, and she smiled through her tears. "'How can I describe the extraordinary sensation produced by the return of Professor Liedenbrock?' Thanks to Martha's ineradicable tattling, the news that the professor had gone to discover a way to the centre of the earth had spread over the whole civilised world. People refused to believe it, and when they saw him they would not believe him any the more. Still, the appearance of Hans, and sundry pieces of intelligence derived from Iceland, tended to shake the confidence of the unbelievers. Then my uncle became a great man— and I was now the nephew of a great man, which is not a privilege to be despised. Hamburg gave a grand fete in our honour. A public audience was given to the professor at the Johanneum, at which he told all about our expedition, with only one omission, the unexplained and inexplicable behaviour of our compass. On the same day, with much state, he deposited in the archives of the city the now famous document of Sucknesem, and expressed his regret that circumstances over which he had no control had prevented him from following to the very centre of the earth the track of the learned Icelander. He was modest, notwithstanding his glory, and he was all the more famous for his humility. So much honour could not but excite envy. There were those who envied him his fame, and as his theories, resting upon known facts, were in opposition to the systems of science upon the question of the central fire, he sustained with his pen and by his voice remarkable discussions with the learned of every country. For my part, I cannot agree with his theory of gradual cooling. In spite of what I have seen and felt, I believe— and always shall believe, in the central heat. But I admit that certain circumstances not yet sufficiently understood may tend to modify in places the action of natural phenomena. While these questions were being debated with great animation, my uncle met with a real sorrow. Our faithful Hans, in spite of our entreaties, had left Hamburg, the man to whom we owed all our success, and our lives too, would not suffer us to reward him as we could have wished. He was seized with the mal de pays, a complaint for which we have not even a name in English. Farval, 
said he one day, and with that simple word he left us and sailed for Reykjavik, which he reached in safety. We were strongly attached to our brave Eiderdown hunter, though far away in the remotest north he will never be forgotten by those whose lives he protected, and certainly I shall not fail to endeavour to see him once more before I die. To conclude, I have to add that this journey into the interior of the earth created a wonderful sensation in the world. It was translated into all civilised languages. The leading newspapers extracted the most interesting passages, which were commented upon, picked to pieces, discussed, attacked, and defended with equal enthusiasm and determination, both by believers and sceptics. Rare privilege! My uncle enjoyed, during his lifetime, the glory he had deservedly won, and he may even boast the distinguished honour of an offer from Mr. Barnum, to exhibit him on most advantageous terms in all the principal cities in the United States. But there was one dead fly amidst all this glory and honour. One fact, one incident, of the journey remained a mystery. Now to a man eminent for his learning, an unexplained phenomenon is an unbearable hardship. Well, it was yet reserved for my uncle to be completely happy. One day, while arranging a collection of minerals in his cabinet, I noticed in a corner this unhappy compass, which we had long lost sight of. I opened it, and began to watch it. It had been in that corner for six months, little mindful of the trouble it was giving. Suddenly, to my intense astonishment, I noticed a strange fact, and I uttered a cry of surprise. "'What is the matter?' my uncle asked. "'That compass!' "'Well?' "'See, its poles are reversed.' "'Reversed?' "'Yes, they point the wrong way.' My uncle looked, he compared, and the house shook with his triumphant leap of exultation. A light broke in upon his spirit and mine. "'See there!' he cried, as soon as he was able to speak. After our arrival at Cape Saknesem, the north pole of the needle of this confounded compass began to point south instead of north. Evidently. Here, then, is the explanation of our mistake. But what phenomenon could have caused this reversal of the poles? The reason is evident, uncle. Tell me, then, Axel. "'during the electric storm on the Liedenbrock Sea. "'That ball of fire which magnetized all the iron on board "'reversed the poles of our magnet.' "'Aha! Aha!' shouted the professor with a loud laugh. "'So it was just an electric joke.' "'From that day forth the professor was the most glorious of savants, "'and I was the happiest of men.' for my pretty Virlandaise, resigning her place as ward, took her position in the old house on the Königstrasse, in the double capacity of niece to my uncle, and wife to a certain happy youth. What is the need of adding that the illustrious Otto Liedenbrock, corresponding member of all the scientific, geographical, and mineralogical societies of all the civilized world, was now her uncle and mine? End of chapter 45, and the end of A Journey to the Interior of the Earth.